premium. What is it? What does it mean? Uh, premium is the cost of the option, right? And when you go to buy or sell, you're going to be paying for that price. $3 premium, $2 premium, what have you. That's the price of the option. But who decides what that premium is going to be? Well, that comes from the, the marketplace. So all market participants, uh, and when I say market participants, I mean everybody, whether it's an individual investor, whether it's a hedge fund or a Wall Street bank, uh, or a professional market maker on the trading floor. All of these market, partic market participants, all of the buyers and sellers, put forth what they call bids and offers. A bid is a price at which an investor, again, whether it's a, an individual investor, market maker, hedge fund, what have you, the bid is the price at which they are willing to pay for the option, pay for that contract. The offer is the price at which they're willing to sell. So if I'm an investor and I'm looking to buy something, I can only buy it at a price at which somebody is willing to sell it to me. So I'm going to be looking at the offer, or also known as the ask. If I'm looking to sell an option, I can only sell it at a price at which somebody's willing to pay. So I would be looking at the bid. But all of these market participants put forth their bids and offers, and the exchanges take the most aggressive bid and the most aggressive offer, and they put them together and they disseminate it out into the world. That's called the National Best Bid, Best Offer, or NBBO. Investors then see those prices and know that, okay, if I want to buy an XYZ $50 call option, I, I can. Uh, the bid is $1, uh, the offer is $1.10, so if I want to buy it, I've got to pay $1.10. If I want to sell it, I can sell it at $1, or I can do it somewhere in between. But that also uh, falls into what the option is worth. How do I know that I want to pay anywhere from a dollar to a dollar ten for this contract? Well, that's going to come from a couple things. Um, it's going to come from pricing models. Uh, it may come from your trading platform. Your trading platform uh, likely has an options calculator. Certainly, we've got options calculators on our website, optionseducation.org. Uh, you can go to our website, take a look at the calculators, put in all of the, the data that you have, your stock price, your strike price, time until expiration, uh, implied volatility levels, et cetera, and the calculator will spit out what we call a fair value. It's going to tell us, based on our inputs that we just entered into the calculator, what that contract should be worth, what the fair value of it is, and what investors and primarily market makers, for example, do is that fair value is they use that in their head that if this option's worth a dollar five and the market on it is you know 110 at 115, 110 bid at 115, but the market maker's pricing model tells them it's worth a dollar five, then maybe that market maker is either going to put in a more aggressive bid, because it's worth a dollar five, maybe they're, uh, uh, or I should say, uh, a more aggressive offer. Uh, maybe they're willing to sell it at a lower price than what the market is. Maybe they're willing to hit the bid. Uh, if somebody is willing to pay a dollar ten for something that I've got a worth a dollar five, I'm going to go ahead and sell it. So these uh, the prices come from all market to par all market participants. The value of an option or the worth of an option is based on what our models tell us, what our pricing models tell us. Um, it's worth what the market tells us. You know, you could have a pricing model. I can, you know, say that something is worth, you know, five dollars. But if somebody's willing to pay ten dollars for it, well then that's what it's worth, right? It's supply and demand. So the basic economic basic economic principles of, pli of supply and demand really control uh, market pricing, regardless of what our models tell us. Uh, again, I can look at a stock and have in my head that, based on all of the financials of this company, it should be worth, you know, thirteen dollars a share. But if the rest of the world is telling me that it's worth twenty-five dollars a share for whatever reason, then that's what it's worth, right? So supply and demand is really the overriding principle. Uh, when it comes to options pricing. Options pricing is made into two components, separated in, into two components. We've got intrinsic value and extrinsic value. Intrinsic value is going to be 
uh, the difference between the stock price and the strike price. Uh, and maybe uh, an in, in easy way to understand this is I've got a $10 bill, right? Uh, how much is that $10 bill worth? Well, it, it's worth $10, right? Kind of the same thing when it comes to the intrinsic value of, uh, of an option contract. If I have the right to pay $50 a share because I own a 50 strike call, and that stock is trading $55 in the market, inherently, we've got to assume that that contract is worth at least $5. Because if I can buy the stock for 50 by exercising my call, turn around and sell it for 55, that's a guaranteed $5 gain. So that option has to be worth at least $5. That's gonna be the intrinsic value, the difference between the stock price and the strike price. That inherent value, that's going to be the intrinsic. We also call it the in the money amount. Now, options aren't worth just their intrinsic value. In, in fact, some options don't have any intrinsic value whatsoever, but that doesn't mean they're free. The other side to it is what we call time value. Um, I should note that when it comes to expiration, um, expiration is kind of a binary event, right? The option is either gonna be worth something or it's gonna be worth nothing. So at expiration, those options are gonna be worth their intrinsic value only. Any time value, which I'll explain in just a moment, um, any time value uh, gets taken out of that contract. There is none. So at expiration, things are only worth their intrinsic value. That extrinsic value, or time value as we call it, uh, an easy way to understand this, let's get back to that $10 bill. So I've got a $10 bill, naturally it's worth $10. What if that $10 bill was autographed by, well, we're from Chicago, so what if it was autographed by Michael Jordan? It's gonna be worth more than $10. Now maybe it's worth 15 or 20 or 30. I'm not even sure what Michael Jordan's autograph would go for today. Uh, but that being said is now there's extra value to that asset that I have. So the $10, that would be the intrinsic value and maybe the Michael Jordan autograph on it is worth another, say, 15 bucks. So the value of that contract is $25. 10 of it is, is intrinsic, 15 of it is extrinsic. That's gonna be everything else. Another way I explain extrinsic value is it's the time that we are buying, if we're an option purchaser, uh, to have things happen. When you're purchasing options, something needs to happen, right? We need the stock to go up or we need the stock to go down, or we need uh, some of the pricing inputs, implied volatility, for example. We need that to fluctuate. We need to uh, be able to increase the value of our contract beyond the premium that we paid for it. Um, so the, all of those things that happen are gonna take time. So extrinsic value, uh, the easiest way to explain it for me is as a purchaser, it's the time I'm buying for things, for the right things to happen. So if I'm buying an option that's six months out, it's gonna cost X amount of money. If I buy it that's expiring in six weeks out, it's going to be a little bit less because there's less time for those things to happen versus an option that's two years down the road. Now there's two years for all of these wonderful or possibly horrible things to happen, uh, but that is going to uh, you know, relate into cost, right? Time is money is a phrase that we're all uh, very, very familiar with. So intrinsic value, the difference between the stock price and the strike price, extrinsic value is all of the other components that going into that option uh, value. And we can break it down a little bit more. So here we've got our options premium triangle. We've got our two uh, components of option pricing, intrinsic and extrinsic. Intrinsic, again, that's gonna be that inherent value uh, between the stock price and the strike price. If we had a $50 call, again, stock trading $55, that option is inherently going to be worth $5. Now, time value or extrinsic value, that's going to be everything else. It's going to be our time until expiration, right? The longer duration that is, the more that uh, option is going to cost. Volatility, implied volatility, and we'll get to that in a second. Interest rates and dividends, depending on what interest rates are. The further we go out, obviously interest rates are gonna be more of a factor. Uh, in the shorter term, it may not be. 
whether or not the company pays a dividend on their stock, because dividends affect the price uh, of uh, option contracts as well. And then implied volatility, that's going to be our last one. Implied volatility is the market's expectation of future volatility for the underlying asset as evidenced by the price of the option. Uh, a, a rather complex concept when it comes to options, certainly beyond that which we have for you today. Uh, but again, if you wanted to uh, ask us some questions later on or visit our website, we've got plenty of uh, inf uh, information, resources, and content explaining these concepts, uh, certainly uh, in a much deeper dive. So let's get back to in the money, at the money, out of the money. Um, again, in the money, it kind of makes sense that if stock is trading 55 and I have the right to buy it for $50, there's a, a guaranteed uh, inherent profit built into that contract, aside from the cost of the contract, just based on that stock price and that strike price, there's that guarantee uh, um, profit in the stock in there. So naturally, we call that in the money, right? A phrase from you know back in the 1920s, I would expect, we're in the money. So with calls, a call is going to be in the money if the stock price is above the strike price of the option, or conversely, if the strike price is below the uh, current stock price. So in our example here, we've got $50 stock, any of these options, any of these call options, you know, $40 strike, $45 strike, those are going to be in the money. So if I have the right to buy stock at $40 when it's trading $50, $50 in the market, I'm in the money. If I can buy stock for $45 and it's trading $50 in the market, I'm in the money. Time does not matter when it comes to the moneyness of an option, the in, at, or out. It doesn't matter if we're looking at a three month contract or a three year contract. As long as my uh, strike price is below the price of the stock, that call option is in the money. At the money, it rarely happens, but at the money is where the stock price equals the strike price. A $50 call on a $50 stock, that is considered at the money. We also talk about at the money for any strikes that are near the stock price. <clears throat> Pardon me. So if stock is trading $53, and um, or stock is trading $53.45. There's not a $53.45 strike, but a $53 call, it's close enough. $54 call, close enough. So anything kind of around that stock price, we generally refer to as at the money. Out of the money is going to be where the option is uh, in the case of a call, the strike price is above the price of the stock. So if I've got stock trading $50 and I have the right to buy at 55, right, it, that's going to be out of the money. It has no intrinsic value. The premium that I pay for that contract is going to be all extrinsic value, all time value. And in this particular case, uh, with out of the money options and out of the money calls, if I'm purchasing, I absolutely need something to happen in order for me to profit. I'm not going to want to buy the stock for $55 at expiration if it's trading 50. So I need that stock price to move. And I need to move it above my strike, above $55. So then I can then become in the money. I actually need it to move by the amount of my strike price plus the premium that I pay in order to break even on the contract. Uh, but that's another story. So. When it comes to in, at, or out of the money for calls, we've got, uh, if the strike is below the stock price, we're in the money. If we're at, uh, the stock price and the strike price are gonna be relatively equal. Out of the money, the strike price is going to be above our stock price. And the other side to the coin is gonna be puts. Puts are gonna be the opposite. Puts are gonna be in the money if our strike price is above the stock. Now remember, Puts, when we purchase a put, it gives us the right to sell that stock at the strike price. We can put our shares to somebody else. We're only going to want to do that in most cases if we're going to realize a profit for it. I'm not going to sell somebody my stock at $50 if it's trading $55 in the market, right? But on the other hand, I would be gladly to sell somebody my stock at $55 when it's trading $50 in the market. So with the put, you're going to be in the money when your strike price is above the stock price. 
at the money is going to work out the same way. Uh, you know, the stock price and the strike price equal, that's going to be at the money. And then out of the money is where our stock price is above our strike. You know, we're not going to want to sell somebody's stock at $45 um, when uh, it's trading 50 in the market. So in, at, and out of the money, that's how those work. Mm -hmm.